first things first, what is coffee? Well, the process starts with these, the seeds of a coffee tree. And yeah, I've said seeds, not beans, because these are technically seeds. They come from like a cherry type fruit. Then they get roasted and they look like this. And that's what's happening in that big machine behind me right there. The coffee seeds are getting roasted. Then you grind it and coffee is complicated. We've actually isolated over 2,000 different substances in ground coffee. You've got fats, carbs, proteins. You've got trigonoline, which is a, a bitter alkaloid. You've got phosphorus, potassium. You've got antioxidants and so many volatile aromas. Guys, it smells so good. But if you're a fan of hot liquids, and let's be honest, who isn't? You'll know that that is not the main event. No, the active ingredient is caffeine. You get it in coffee, you get it in tea, and also chocolate. Now, caffeine is a small molecule, and under the strict rules of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, I'm sure you guys know that we should be calling it 137 trimethylpurine 26 diode Yes, let's just call it caffeine. I think that will suffice, yeah? But what it does mean is it's got carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen in it, the four most common elements in all living organisms. So far, so normal. Here's something interesting though. Caffeine actually occurs naturally in more than 60 different plant species. And it evolved independently twice. Cocoa and coffee actually developed their caffeine making techniques slightly differently. So what makes caffeine so useful to all those plants? Well, leaves full of caffeine contaminate the soil. And that means that you can be the only plant on the block. And also packing your seeds full of caffeine wards off insects really cool story I found. NASA, for some reason, decided they would feed caffeine to some spiders to see the effect. Well, check this out. Kind of trippy. On the other hand, putting a little bit of caffeine in your nectar, which coffee plants do, gives uh, pollinating insects a bit of a buzz, keeps them coming back for more. So plants love making caffeine, but what's in it for you? How does it keep you awake? Well, essentially, it's acting on the central nervous system and making you more alert. You see, the caffeine messes with brain signaling molecule known as adenosine. Adenosine is a byproduct when your neurons fire and it makes you feel tired. Caffeine is what's known as a receptor antagonist. It binds to the receptors meant for adenosine. So that means that those slow down messages can't get to the brain. And it means that the brain's natural stimulants get free reign. Now how much caffeine you take in depends on all sorts of things from the length of time that it's brewed for to the variety of bean to the delivery system. But I didn't realise until recently that a standard cup of filter coffee actually has more caffeine in it than an espresso. And caffeine also affects other nerve receptors too. It acts on your kidneys to make you want to pee. It gets your heart muscle beating faster and it can cause some of your smooth muscle to relax. That's why it feels like caffeine affects the whole body, because it does. Caffeine has been held responsible for everything from protecting the liver and reducing the risk of diabetes to potentially leaching calcium out of your bones and causing or reducing heart problems. As I said, coffee is complex and it can also act on some people's colons pretty quickly in something around four minutes. Back in a sec. And that fast reaction is interesting because caffeine actually takes time to kick in. It takes around 45 minutes for caffeine to peak in your bloodstream. And that is the basis for that life hack that says that you should take a little snooze after having your cuppa because the rising caffeine buzz will awaken you in about 45 minutes, ready to nail that piece of work. Okay, so that's what's in those magical beans and why a shot or two gives you a buzz. But I bet with all this talk of coffee, you're craving a cup. Am I right? Well, that's because caffeine is addictive. We've known that since 1994. And that's because people continue to use it even if it's bad for their health. There have been unsuccessful attempts at quitting. A tolerance builds up over time and you get withdrawal symptoms if you try to quit. The thing that sucks is that if you have a coffee every day, you stop noticing the effects. And one of the reasons for that is because the brain is actually able to produce more adenosine receptors to compensate for the ones that caffeine is blocking. The little buzz you get in the morning isn't from a caffeine hit. It's actually from curing your caffeine withdrawal overnight. And because your brain has adapted, if you quit, you get headaches 
and feel tired. In fact, caffeine withdrawal was added to America's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in May 2013. The good news is that it only takes 7 to 12 non-caffeine days to get back to normal. The bad news is that not much of the world actually manages that. Caffeine craving runs all the way around the planet and it's been estimated that 90% of the people in the entire world use caffeine in one way or another. So I don't think the world will be giving up coffee anytime soon and that could be a good thing. Some historians reckon that in the 17th and 18th century it was coffee houses that kick-started the Age of Enlightenment. In fact, Tom Standage says that before then, people started their day with beer. So a fashion for coffee may have actually pulled us out of an alcoholic haze that had lasted for centuries. So with your morning cup of coffee, you are continuing a tradition that has brought us the likes of Newton, Jefferson, and maybe even YouTube. I'll drink to that. For more great scientific coffee content, why not check out this video from our friends at DNews. Of other Americans, nearly 83% of the population drinks coffee, according to the National Coffee Association. Another survey by Zagat found that most people drink 2.1 cups a day.